Now, as we go into God's word, let's, let's stop and pray. Thank you, Father, for the great things you are doing. Thank you for our growth. Thank you for your presence, your love, and your mercy. Thank you for what you have done already through the prayer vigil. And as we continue to pray, thank you for what you are doing in Kincardine. May God be with Chris and Jean and their team as they uh, launch this new coffee house ministry, this drop-in center uh, on Main Street. God, would your hands be all over that. God, would you continue to work in Cuba, and we pray for a home for this family, that they can begin to work in planting a church in Sanctus Spiritus. So many great things, Father. You are alive and active. You are loving and almighty, God. And God, as we think about our church and our building project, again, we will say we want your plan, your way, in your time. Father, it's not too late for you to stop us. It is also not too late for others to jump in and come with us on that journey. But God, would you have your way? We release this to you. And we will continue to follow as you lead. Thank you for the generosity of your people. God, as we go into your word this morning, would you make your word come alive to us? In the, the real simplicity of what Jesus says this morning, Father, would you work that deep into our hearts in a way that changes us because we've been in your word this morning. So we come with open hands, open hearts, and open minds. Speak to us as you would. In Jesus' name, amen. This week I watched a video, um, a Ravi Zacharias video, and I posted it on our church Facebook page, so maybe some of you have seen it already. But Ravi Zacharias uh, travels around and goes to universities and um, speaks in universities defending our faith in an intelligent, logical, clear, solid way, and then takes question and answers. And in this one video... Uh, it, it's the situation where a young Muslim student stood up to the microphone and asked a question. His question was this. In, in, in Islam and Judaism, there are really deep, thick, broad moral codes. There's a law for every aspect of life. But in Christianity, it appears that Jesus made that law defunct and all there is is love and be nice and fluffy. And he says, with no disrespect, how do you think Christianity, without that legalistic moral code, how do you think there's any power to impact society? So Ravi Zacharias, in his answer, immediately went to Matthew chapter 5. And that's where we're going again this morning, to the Sermon on the Mount. And to this passage exactly that we're looking at today. And he explains to him that Jesus does not come to abolish the law. He doesn't come to end it or destroy it or say we're, it's done and gone. But actually, he says Jesus comes, as in this passage says, to fulfill the law. And fulfill, uh, you know, simply thinking about um, to fulfill the law, to, to bring life to it, to bring it to its fullness is what Jesus came to do. Jesus comes, Ravi Zachariah says, Jesus comes to take us to a higher ground than simply the legalistic law. The law stands. And here's the cool part. What he said was, the Judaizers and Islam depend on the law because your obedience to the law is what redeems you 
in God's eyes. That's what makes you right with God. So your level of obedience puts you into right standing with God. He says, here's what Jesus did. Jesus disconnected the, the legalistic obedience to the law from, from redemption. It's not the obedience of the law and the do's and don'ts that saves you. It's Jesus. And instead of, here's the moral code, you must live this way to please God. Because of Jesus, we please God. And as a result, I obey the moral code. Completely turning it upside down. And Jesus goes on in this passage we're going to look at today and looks at six examples of how the moral code says this, but Jesus says this. And we're going to look at that. The, the, in that day, the Pharisees had huge issue with Jesus about this because their perspective of Jesus was that he's completely destroying the law of Moses, that moral code. He's ripping apart, he's ignoring it, he's not living by it. And this was everything the Pharisees lived their lives on. Everything stood on that. So if Jesus is ripping it apart, he's killing them and their way and what they've established. And Jesus goes on to talk about that straight on. He addresses this in, in, this, in this whole sermon, chapter 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew, where he's talking about life in the kingdom of God. Now, if you've been traveling with us the last couple of weeks, we've defined the kingdom of God this way. And I think this comes from the Sermon on the Mount, that the kingdom of God is those people who live as if God is king. That right here, right now, today, Jesus is king of me. And if I live that way, that is the kingdom of God. That starts now and goes through eternity. It's not a future thing or place. It's these people today. So if you have a Bible, I hope you do, go to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, the passage that we looked at just a few minutes ago that Amy read for us. Jesus knows what the Pharisees are thinking here. And he goes straight at it. He says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them. Verse 18, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or a dot will pass away, pass from the law until it is accomplished. Jesus, uh, I know that when, when someone was teaching, when there was a public meeting of any kind of importance, the most important people sat front. It was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Would, they would have the front row seats. Now, if it was me, and we're in a meeting like that, and, and I did not like the person presenting, I'm likely not to sit in the front row, right? In our culture, we would stand in the back like, that, like those guys, like Ken is, right? That's, and then I could think, and I could talk to the person, and I could criticize, and all that. But in, in that culture, those people that were, you know, they were, say, sat right at the front. So here's Jesus. He's got these Pharisees right in the very front. And he says, I didn't come to destroy the law. He's talking to them. As a matter of fact, not even the smallest detail of the smallest punctuation mark will be removed. And they're starting to lean in. And he goes on and he says, if you keep the law and you teach the law, you're the highest in the kingdom of heaven. What's happening in their mind? Okay, this is good. We're leaning in. And then Jesus... Boom, pulls the carpet out from underneath them because what he says is, if you loosen or slacken some of these laws and teach that, you're the least in the kingdom. He was talking completely about the Pharisees and what they did. And as we look at this today, I don't want to jump ahead, then I'll mess up my notes. But what the Pharisees would do is they would take these laws and read them and not necessarily manipulate them, but they, if, if there was a quote this long, they would take these three words and jump all over that and make all these rules and legalistic aspects about that and not even mention the rest of it, often taking it completely out of context. So they're missing the point of the law in order to establish this. Does that make sense? 
And so Jesus is actually saying to them, you're loosening the law and you're teaching that. You're the least in the kingdom. And then look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. He says to everybody, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Picture this. The, the Pharisees spent their entire lives on the law. Every little bit, as thoroughly and as deep. They were the highest regarded. They were the perfect ones. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness, unless the way you live does, it exceeds them, that's impossible. How do we do that? How in the world do we do that? But Jesus says here he didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. What is the law? What, we have to know the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law, as we read the rest of the New Testament, the purpose of the law is to show us ourselves. It shows us we can't do it. It shows us this is impossible. It shows us where we're imperfect. It shows us where we need to be rescued. Like when I look in a mirror and I see that my face has dirt all over it, the mirror shows me my, my stuff. You understand that? But in order to get clean, I don't rub my face on the mirror to get the dirt off. That's the perspective of the Pharisees. It's the law that cleans me. Jesus is saying the law shows you you need to be cleaned. Okay? See the twist? This is Jesus' upside-down kingdom. Actually, Galatians chapter 3. You don't need to turn there. Uh, just for the sake of time. Now, before faith came, we were held captive by the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian. Another translation will say tutor. The King James says schoolmaster. The law was our schoolmaster, our tutor, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now, faith has come. We no longer need the tutor. We live without it. Does that make sense? The law, all this law is not done and gone, but it was our tutor to show us we need Jesus. And now that we don't need the tutor anymore, because we got Jesus. All right? Now, Gonna figure out where I'm supposed to be. Before we dig into six examples that Jesus gives us, let me put this picture in your head. We've all been in Niagara Falls, I assume. And at Niagara Falls, if you're walking along the sidewalk right beside the river, uh, there is a big railing, stone with metal rails. Okay? How many of you have actually climbed over that to take a picture? Don't tell me I'm the only one. Come on. <laughs> Why is that railing there? It's to keep us from falling in, right? Falling over. The railing is there to protect us on the edge of disaster. I've been, I've been in England, and I went to the White Cliffs of Dover. And um, as we approached that, there was, we're on its path, and then there was this massive fence that says... Do not go beyond this, right? The ground is unstable, and there's danger. The weird thing is, is past this massive fence and sign, the path keeps going. So we jump over the fence, and we start walking towards, on, we're on the path, and we're going. When you actually get to the edge of the cliffs, there, there's a little fence there. But why is the fence there? Because if we've actually crossed the line before and stayed on the path all the way to the edge. This is to keep us to actually from killing ourselves. Okay, I want you to have that picture in your mind. And this picture is, uh, is going to come back after every, every point I make this morning, after every example of Jesus gives us we look at, this is going to pop up back to remind you of that, okay? So get that picture stuck in your mind. Um, we probably don't need to look at all of these. But we'll, we'll go through them one at a time. 
And sometimes when Jesus is teaching, he uses the phrase, it is written. And he's quoting the Old Testament. Interesting here, Jesus doesn't talk, he doesn't use the word, the phrase, it is written. He uses the phrase, you've heard that it has been said. There's a huge difference between those two phrases. Because what the Pharisees would do is they would take what was written and mess with it and twist it and shrink it so that it fit with them and what they wanted to do. And they taught that. He said that a few minutes ago. And so these people, all they knew about the law would have been from these guys. And so Jesus is quoting what they teach, and he's not saying it is written. He's saying you've probably heard this. So that you'll see this phrase over and over and over. You've heard that it's been said, but I say. Look, look, okay, let's go to verse 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable of judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be, will be liable to the, the fires of hell. You've heard it was said, do not murder. That is a direct quote from the law. Like a line in the sand. Do not cross this line. Do not murder. But what about everything else that leads up to murder? Okay, go back to the, 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 the fence and the, and the fence and the pathway. What the, what the uh, Pharisees would do was say, the line of sin is murder. But if I, as long as I don't cross that line, I could undercut. I could wreck your life. I could hate I could spread rumors. I could do all of this as long as I don't cross the line. What about the path that actually leads to murder? This is what Jesus is getting at. The same sin that would cause us to kill somebody starts way before that. It's not just about keeping us in line from doing bad. But what Jesus is teaching us isn't just about not doing bad. It's about inspiring us to do good. The attitude Jesus teaches here fixes relationships, not helps us to run from them. It's radical. What Jesus is saying is actually run from the line of sin. Run the other way. It's not just the one who murders. Jesus said it's the one who harbors anger in their heart. Now that gets expressed all kinds of different ways. He uses the example when you call somebody, uh, you fool. That, that word in, in Greek is raka and actually means moron. Okay, how many when you're driving? I don't even need to say the illustration. Do you? you know what I mean. What comes out our mouth? You moron. That's exactly what Jesus is saying here. What does that in our heart is crossing that first gate that says, do not enter. And I'm on the path towards murder. Now, I'm never going that far, right? You're never going that far. But what Jesus is saying clearly here is the sin of murder is exactly the same as the sin that comes out my mouth that says, you moron. Because it's the heart it's in the head. It's exactly the same sin. Pharisees dealt with the line of murder. And if we actually go back into the Old Testament law, we can see this, this heart that Jesus says. So Jesus says in verse 23 uh, and 26, how do we actually handle this? So if you're offering your gift at the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go. Be reconciled to your brother before you come and worship. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, even if you're on the way to court. Deal with it, because if you end up in court, then it's out of your hands. And there's a couple of passages in, in the Old Testament that talk about this. 
And, he, and when we look at the, those exact things that the Pharisees were quoting, they're talking, I'll, I'll come back to that later. First John chapter 4 says, you say you love the Lord, but you have anger or bitterness in your heart. You're a liar. Those are strong words. Any harbored hatred or, hatred or bitterness or anger to anyone in your heart, it's the same sin, Jesus is saying, as murder. In a sense, here's what Jesus is saying. You've heard it's okay to go right up to the line. I'm saying, don't even get on the path. Keep off the path that leads to the fence that protects you from falling. So does Jesus downgrade the law? No. He takes us to a whole new level. Look at the next one, verse 27. Talking about sex and relationships. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in her heart. You see the same thing here? Jesus says, you've heard this. And yes, the law says do not commit adultery. But the law has so, much, so many more words in there that what they've done is they've peeled this part out, made this the law, and everything that leads up to it is okay as long as I don't cross the line of adultery. Same point. The fence is to keep us from falling off, but don't even get on the path. So, if you're not married... Any sexual contact, touching, talking dirty, sexting, TV programs, movies, fantasizing about relationships, maybe even romance novels. Aren't these all on the same path? There's no way to say they're not. The line the Pharisees focused on was the adultery. The path that Jesus describes is lust. The thinking about and harboring and stirring and causing energy, the heart part of this is jumping the fence and getting on the path. So Barna in the United States does research in all kinds of great things. One of the biggest research companies uh, in the States. And, and they uh, surveyed in the last year 13 to 24-year-olds about right and wrong and what is morally wrong. And first of all, they found that there was nothing that everybody agreed on that was wrong. What do you think the very first thing they found was? What did most people agree on? The very first thing they found that 88% of the people said was wrong is stealing. The second one, at 75%, was adultery. The fourth one, not far behind, was not recycling. Now, that sounds awfully funny, because the world I grew up in, we didn't recycle at all. But that's why the world is like it is today, right? The next one after recycling was using too much electricity. Way down the line was pornography. Way down the line uh, was coveting. They actually worded it as strongly desiring something that's not mine. Right? In Scripture, do not commit adultery, do not covet. And interestingly, the example the Scripture gives is do not covet your neighbor's wife, which <laughs> tied to, to adultery, right? Jesus is saying it's not about the line of adultery, but the path way back here before you even get on the path is the longing to have, the stirring in my mind like that anger, the holding on to wanting something that's not mine. That's where the line, and if, if that is not not an issue in my life, then the line of adultery disappears. That's what Jesus is getting at. Jesus calls it what it is. You cannot harbor this in your heart. You cannot spend your energy. Jesus talks about that. He continues on. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of the members of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to lose one of your members than to throw your whole body into hell. 
hyperbole. Here's why I know this is a hyperbole. Because if we are going to spend sexual energy on anything or anybody that's not my wife or husband, that's adultery. Jesus is saying way before that is the lust. But you know what? If I pluck my eye out or cut my hand off, I can still lust. How I act on it might be different. So it's a hyperbole. Jesus is saying, go to extreme lengths to get this out of your head and out of your heart. Not this, this, back at the first fence. Do everything, take drastic measure to get that out of your heart. Don't miss the strength of what he's saying. The path will destroy you long before the adultery happens. Am I just seeing how close to the edge I can get? Or am I trying to live the way God wants me to? Divorce is the next one. He's really still on the same topic, but he says in verse 31, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's still talking about adultery. But there's something else going on here. You've heard that it's been said that if you're going to divorce, you have to give a, a, a certificate. Get it in writing, do it legally, he says. Here's what happened. The Pharisees took this approach to the law. Here, here's an example from the New Testament that, that I think we'll understand. In Matthew chapter 5, um, verse 38, Jesus says, If someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. Here's what the Pharisees would do. Well, that means it's okay to strike someone. Because it says, if someone strikes you, well, that's assumed striking is going to happen. Okay? Did, did you see that weird logic? Rewind to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter uh, 24, where we have this whole passage about divorce, where they get this law from. And that says, if this, 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 then give a certificate of divorce. What did the Pharisees jump all over? They scrapped all the ifs. And what they were actually teaching in that day was, it doesn't matter what the reason is. You could divorce for any reason if you've fallen out of love as long as you give a certificate of divorce. What's Jesus say? You've heard, it's been said, give a certificate. But I say, way back before that, okay, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus uh, is talking, and the Pharisees come up to him and say, same issue exactly, and in, that, in this chapter 19 of Matthew, the Pharisees come up and say, so is it lawful to divorce for any cause? This is what they've been teaching. Then why did Moses say give a certificate of divorce? Jesus must just be going, how many times do I have to go through this? And he points out there that you guys mess with Scripture. You guys mess with Scripture and it's not okay. Moses allowed it, says there in verse 7, because you screwed it up so much. Jesus says, I say it's the same statement. Deal with the first fence, not the second fence. Okay, quickly, I'm way out of time already. Oaths. Oaths is simple here. Our, our Scripture says uh, here... Do not make an oath and swear by this or by this or by this. And it lists a whole bunch of things. If you go to, there's another passage too in Matthew chapter 23 that I would have liked to have gone to. But it also says, do not swear by this or by this or by this or by this, right? So here's what they did. Oaths are normal and common. And all the way through scripture, God even makes oaths. It's not the oaths that are the problem. It's the swearing by, and here's why. Uh, how many of you, especially when you were kids, cross your fingers, and you make a statement, what does that do? It means what I said doesn't matter, right? The Pharisees did exactly that. They actually had an elaborate system of oaths that if I, I swore an oath on this, these rules apply. If I swore an oath on this, these rules apply. If I swore an oath on this, these. 
So if I said, I swear an oath on this beautiful mug, then these, what it did in all this intricacy of laws, it, it rendered their word meaningless. Because they could get a loophole no matter what. So I could say whatever I want to you, and it doesn't matter. I got my fingers crossed. What is Jesus saying? You've heard, but I say, don't swear by anything. Jesus doesn't say here, don't make oaths. He says, don't swear by anything. Let your yes be yes, your no by you. Above all, the point Jesus is making is, here's the line, don't swear by stuff. Back here, the line is, honor your word. Live in a way that your word means something. Going to make a promise? Live your life in such a way that your word means something. Let me do the last two together. Verse uh, 38. You've heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist the one who is evil. But if someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. If anyone would sue you for your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who begs from you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard it's been said, you love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And he continues on in that train of thought. If you live on earth, you will have friends and you will have enemies. If you live on earth, you will have people who hurt you and you will have people who love you. The Pharisees had taught it's to love the people who love you. It's easy to love those ones. It's hard to love the people that mistreat us. And this is what Jesus is talking about. People who smack you on the face, who give you insults. Think about the living there with the Roman guards watching over everything. How, how much they hated foreigners. The Pharisees, Pharisees emphasize part of the law. An eye for an eye. Correct. That's what the Bible says. But if we look in those passages in Deuteronomy 19 and Exodus 21, they're talking to judges in the court. The way you determine a sentence is an eye for an eye. But what Jesus is saying is you never take personal vengeance. Never take it into your own hands. Leave that to him. And if something has to be done, you go to court and the judge will deal with it. That was their Old Testament law. The Pharisees were teaching an eye for an eye, so if you do something to me, you get it right back. You've heard the phrase, I don't get mad, I get even. There is not a free phrase anywhere that is more opposed to the life of Jesus than that phrase. That's what this part is talking about. They saw justification for vengeance. When it said eye for an eye, that gave us justification for vengeance. So I can go as close to the line as I possibly want. What's Jesus saying? Back up the truck to the fence that was back here with the sign on it. Don't even get on the path that's going to lead to that. The law of Moses actually demands that we treat enemies fairly. Okay, let me go back to where we started. For the last couple of weeks, we've been in this series on the ser Sermon on the Mount. In the kingdom of God are the people who are living with Christ as king now. Jesus is calling you and I to live his way. Don't even get on the path that leads to the fence that's supposed to help you. If we live the way Jesus is saying here, who cares where the line is? I don't even need to know what that line is because I'm never going to see the line of murder because I'm not even going to ever harbor bitterness in my heart. I'm never going to see the line of adultery. Adultery doesn't even matter if it's right or wrong because I'm never even getting get on the path of looking and longing. I'm never going to, I don't need to know what the law is about swearing by this or swearing by this or swearing on my mother's grave or any. I don't even need to know that because I'm coming way back here and saying my word is my word and I live that way. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He did not come to abolish the law. He came to call his people way beyond the law. 
to live in a way that honors God. So here's what we've done so far in three weeks if you're with us. The first week we looked at the Beatitudes, the Christian's nature. This is who we are. The last week we looked at the Christian's influence, the salt and light, and how you will radically impact your world for good. Today we look at the Christian's heart, the one who is living with Jesus as king today. This is the kingdom of God. It isn't about do's and don'ts. Do's and don'ts are critical. But do's and don'ts don't make us right with God. Because Jesus makes us right with God, the do's and don'ts are a response to live in the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, I put up a gate three miles back. Why are you falling over the edge? Don't even get on the path that leads to the gate. So how do, we, how do we do this? Let me wrap this up really quickly. Sorry, this is... These three banners, as we look at this scripture and say, what do I do about this? I want us to go back to this. Every time you read scripture, every time you're in your life group, every time we're in a conversation about what Jesus says, go back here. And, and, and let me, I, I, won't, I won't get into it here, but think about this. What have we just learned about God, about God's kingdom? about the way that God wants us to live, his expectations for us, what is, about our life as a follower of Jesus. What have we just learned about that? That's the knowledge part. Then become like Jesus. Let's do that. Let's live that. The, fa- the final verse, I close my Bible, the final verse in this chapter says, then don't be like them. Be like your Father in heaven who is perfect. Become. That will change your world. It will change the world as you interact with people around you, but it will change how you see your world. This is the simplicity of our vision. Let's go back to that all the time. Now, I don't know about you, as I look at those six things today, I spent a lot of my life strategizing and thinking and finding loopholes, and and a gift that God had given me for leadership, I actually used most of my life selfishly to try to find ways that I could justify my own actions. Come on, folks. I've got changing to do. How about you? Let's live as kingdom citizens. You cannot be a follower of Jesus and not follow Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your words here today are so simple and so logical, I don't understand why it's so impossible. So Father, Holy Spirit, would you infill us? Would you change us at the deepest level of our heart? So that we can follow Jesus. We want to live authentically following Jesus with our lives. God, bring us to the place where we don't even think about getting on the path that would lead us to the fence that says there's danger. Help us to see our world and our lives and situations through your eyes. Help us to live in a way that honors you and is upside down in our world. God, be at work in us. Stir in us as we respond to your truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.